Hi, this is Steve. Welcome again to BlessedHopeForever.com. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, God has come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the opportunity that we have to come together and feast on your word. I just ask that the Holy Spirit would take charge of this hour, that he would filter out all of that which is not of you, all of that which is ignorance and foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We have been studying together in the first epistle of the Corinthians verse by verse, going through it, not cherry picking verses, but uh, an expository verse by verse, under, trying to understand the, the thought that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey through these most difficult verses. And in my last video, I continued uh, to the annoyance of many, I'm sure, to keep emphasizing the fact that this is not Paul's word, but it's God's word. It is God's word. It's not Paul's reasoning, not, not his logic. Uh, of course, God was working through Paul. But the word that the church received from Paul was the word of God. And we're going to talk about in this video just how effectual that word can be and how that we're not under law, but we're under grace. And uh, if you're just now joining us in this uh, study through chapter 5, which I suggested was one of the more difficult passages, given the fact that uh, many believe that this is just simply uh, tossing someone out of the church because of bad behavior, you know, uh, I suggested that it was not the church that excommunicated this man, it wasn't Paul that excommunicated this man, but it, the, that the text is saying that God the Holy Spirit delivered this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh in order that his spirit may be saved in the day of Christ Jesus. So we're going to talk a little bit about works. Uh, I believe this, it's important that we at least discuss spend some time discussing the matter of how works relates to our lives as being believers who are not under law, but under grace. So I would suggest that for some of you, if you really want to uh, maybe uh, make this a little easier on yourselves, uh, take notes. Uh, some of these, I'm going to be jumping around a lot. Uh, I think I would be uh, uh, it would be awful difficult with as many as much ground as I want to cover uh, to actually put all of these verses up on the screen. So you're basically going to have to settle for a, a fake waterfall. Uh, uh, so perhaps that'll relieve some of the tension that's uh, involved in some of these verses. There's a natural tension, some say, that exists between the sovereignty of God and the free will, so-called free will of man. And folks, I don't see that there's any tension where there's any tension. I don't, it doesn't seem to me that any tension exists. And so we're going to talk about a few things that have to do with, with why we're looking at a situation in which this particular man who had his father's wife was delivered over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh which I have suggested is referring to the works of the flesh, the flesh in us, the old man, not delivered over to Satan for physical death per se, but for the destruction of the flesh, which is a good thing. I suggested that rather than look at this as something really awful, but that it was something good. 
We saw how that God's grace was extended toward these Corinthians right from the very beginning, that they were not lacking in any spiritual grace. I think it's important to keep uh, it, it, keep it in mind from right from the very outset that we are not under law but under grace. God's grace toward these Corinthians was shown in abundance. He didn't come out and lambast them for what they were doing wrong. He can he continues to show grace, and I believe we'll see grace all the way from the to, through the, the entire epistle to the Corinthians. In the Old Testament, they did not have the indwelling Spirit as we do as believers in Christ today. Key point, okay? In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon them temporarily for service and left. They were not indwelt as we are. The body of Christ is unique in that sense. We have the very fullness of the triune God living inside us and that is not was not true of old testament israel it will not be true of those in the tribulation period once again in the tribulation period the old testament will come upon individuals temporarily for service and then depart not depart from the earth but depart from them because god works in them by his spirit but they're not indwelt as we are. And that's an important point to, to consider as we go forward here. We have the Holy Spirit. So we're not under law, we're under grace. So now, that, now there's a different, entirely different dynamic taking place here that we need to look at. We also need, need to consider the purpose for the law. The law was never given to make man righteous. It was never given to this man who had his father's wife to curb that type of sinful behavior or to make him righteous or to make anyone else righteous in the body of Christ there at Corinth. The purpose of the law was to drive us to Christ, who is our life. Now we could spend some time talking about the effects of law keeping in the believer's life. And this is a very sensitive subject I'm going to suggest that the majority of Christendom today, believers in Christ, who are truly in Christ, as well as those who are professing and who are not truly of God, consider the Christian life today a life that is primarily involved in just following God's instructions, doing what they're told, obeying, quote-unquote, God, in the sense that they read what's in Scripture and kind of like Nike, it's, it's like read it and do it. Just read it and do it. I've suggested time and time again, this Bible is not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life, but is primarily the revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We are not under law, but grace. We also know that the law is the strength of sin. The law is the strength of sin. The law gives, power, gives sin its power. Why is that? Well, it's because we've been joined together by death, identification with Him in His death, burial, and resurrection, joined with Christ, together with Him, in our inner man, that new creation, that sinless new creation, in which we're one with Him, as well as one with one another. We are not married to the law. We are espoused to Christ. Dearly beloved, I spoke a little bit in a previous video about the reality of adultery and on a physical level and how that it corrupts the family. Any natural earthly family, most of us would agree that adultery or fornication is devastating. I want you to consider just how devastating that it must be for us to be married to Christ while having an endless flirtatious affair with the law. The law of which we died to in order that we might bear fruit unto God. There is 
something called spiritual adultery. Now, in this discussion in which this video is centered around the whole reality of works, uh, as I mentioned, God's abundant grace was shown these believers at Corinth. There was no judgment. There therefore is no judgment for those who are in Christ. I suggested that the man that we're looking at was in fact redeemed. So many confuse the, the, the two words. They, they, are, they actually mingle the two words, redeemed and saved. They look at redeemed and saved as synonyms. They're not. We are redeemed in order to be saved. The text does not say that he was delivered over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh in order that his spirit may be redeemed in the day of Christ Jesus, but saved. So God delivers him unto Satan. Folks, you can't save a man that's, that's not alive. You know, a fireman wouldn't run into a burning building and drag out a, 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 a burned corpse and say that he saved the man. This is in order that his spirit may be saved in the day of Christ Jesus. His spirit may be saved, not his body redeemed. We are looking at, those of us who are looking for the rapture, we're, we're looking for the deliverance, the redemption of our bodies. This is his spirit that's being saved in the day of, of Christ Jesus. Uh, the text absolutely suggests that you can be a Christian, you can be involved in a what we would consider a gross sin. And I talked a little bit about, I asked, I asked you, you folks the question, what is the difference really between uh, committing adultery and stealing a penny? I know that uh, that may sound a little ridiculous on the outside, but as far as God's concerned, sin is sin. Sin is sin. And I suggest that if all you did was steal a penny, that Christ would have to, to come down from heaven, leave heaven's glory, and die on a cross for that sin. Why did God choose this one particular sin? And I suggested that there was, I believe, there was some, at least the, the heart of the Holy Spirit in the intent in, in bringing up this whole reality of fornication and sexual immorality, that there was a, at least a shadow pattern connection between the physical act and the spiritual act of committing adultery. And that's exactly what we're going to see as we go down through the text and continue looking at these verses that follow this man being delivered over to Satan. Now, uh, this is a question I'd like to pose to you at this point. You know, after looking at God delivering this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh in order that his spirit may be saved in the day of Christ Jesus, why is it that now all of a sudden we are thrust into a, a, a new thought, a new context, you might say, of the Holy Spirit where that it, it appears that we go from the man being delivered over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh in order that his spirit may be saved in the day of Christ Jesus. And now all of a sudden, we're in Martha Stewart's cooking class. You know, purge out the old leaven. The text says, purge out the old leaven. Now, is that man who did this act, is he that leaven? No, he's not. We need to, to take note of the fact that now we're looking at a body context. It's the Holy Spirit speaking not to, this, not to the body about this man as much as it is the body itself. That within the body of, of believers there at Corinth, which was God's church, they didn't just get together and decide they were going to become a church. Purge out the old leaven. Why is it that all of a sudden now we go from the... the this awful deed that this man committed into, uh, I don't know, a, a, a ki into the kitchen. You know, are we looking, you know, at some cooking, you know, lesson on leaven? Okay. Well, of course not. Purge out the old leaven. 
for in fact you have been un you are not you will be you are unleavened this is what the text says now I did uh, I don't know if I mentioned this or not about communion the Lord's Supper uh, the Lord taking the you know both the bread and, and the cup the, the bread and, and the wine and the eating and the drinking of this 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 was the feast that followed the Passover but we are told right in this uh, this very text to feast upon Jesus Christ it's always a feast that follows Passover Christ is our Passover okay and, I, and I, I'm sure I'm, I must have mentioned the fact that this was repeated every year in Israel but this is a one-time sacrifice as Hebrews said for, for once just one time I mean Christ died he's not going to come and die again which is a strong message in the in the book of Hebrews the author of, of the book of Hebrews pointed out the fact he's not coming to die again for by one sacrifice he's perfected forever them which are sanctified. Now, folks, this Bible, this book, is not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life. It is much more grand, grandiose than that. I, it's a word I hardly, rarely use, grandiose. It is the revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. What would have caused a situation or arranged for a situation in which this man who had his father's wife in which this would have never taken place and by the way don't think for one moment that God did not construct design engineer the circumstance for your good for my good for the good of those at Corinth and for the good of the, of the man who did it okay we worship a sovereign God this did not happen by chance this man did not just surprise God by what he did. Get that down pat, okay? It's not a matter of just reading it, picking up that book, folks, and just reading it. it you cannot, you've got to scratch your head when you pick up a Bible that said, the Bible that says that you're not under law but you're under grace, you've died to the law in order that you might bear fruit unto God, and yet you see in page after page after page, God's commandment, God's commands, they're in the imperative mood, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, but, but, but by the way, you're not under law, but you're under grace. Has, have you ever stopped to ask yourself why that is? We know from previous studies, we know many, many believers are aware of the fact that it is the righteousness of God that comes on the basis of faith. Abraham believed God. It was reckoned unto him for righteousness. We know that there is an association, a relationship, a connection between faith and righteousness. What many don't realize is that that exercise of faith when we're trusting God is not, you cannot separate that from the faithfulness of God. There is a definite connection, a definite relationship between this passage that we're studying and Paul's words in Romans concerning the righteousness of God that is based on faith. It's a genitive, it is faith's righteousness. Okay? And it is His righteousness, not our, own, not our own. Many Christians are aware of the fact that all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. So how do we approach these, these verses? How do we come to understand these verses in light of, the, of all these facts? That we're not under law. That it's the righteousness of God. We have none of our... Any, any, we have no righteousness in and of ourselves. Now it is true that the new man... The new, new created, the new creation, we saw this in 1 John, that that new sinless man cannot sin. It doesn't have the power, doesn't have the ability to sin, but we also know from Romans chapter 7 that we have an old man that God did not eradicate, okay? And that these two natures are in conflict with one another. Oh, wretched man I am, 
Who shall deliver me from this body of sin and death? Was the man who had his father's wife, was he wretched? Were they mourning? Dearly beloved, the point I'm trying to get you to look at here, the fact I'm trying to get you to look at is that there's no connection between, the direct connection between purge out the old leaven and get rid of this guy that's doing this awful thing. Okay, now he's switched to a body context. It's purge out among yourselves, plural, the body. The body of believers there at Corinth. The old leaven. So we're being instructed here by the Holy Spirit in a very dynamic way. The Holy Spirit is pushing, elevating that most vitally important fact that we, as believers in Christ, have nothing to do with law, keeping as a rule of life. Law keeping as a principle of life. Okay? Law keeping. Legalism. Cleaning up the old man. Cleaning up the flesh. Naturally, the, the act that this man did, this awful act, as well as every other sin, as we see in Galatians 5, stems from the flesh in us, the old man. The old man which was crucified with Christ. The old man which was crucified with Christ. God has nothing to do with the flesh. We know that the flesh profits nothing. Okay? So maybe perhaps for the first time, I don't know. I, I don't have any, we don't have any way of knowing for sure. Maybe we do. Maybe I just haven't seen it. That this is the first time these believers at Corinth are coming to realize or being instructed the first time that they've ever heard or the first time that they're being told, instructed along the lines that, that yes, there's, there's flesh present within the body, but we're not under flesh, we're, we're not under law as it regards our spiritual walk in, in Christ. Uh, this, this subject, he's not dealing with the subject of redemption. He's dealing with the subject of salvation that the Spirit may be saved in the day of Christ Jesus. I, I can hear the objection now. I, well, Steve, what, I know, but what about James? Well, you know, uh, faith without works is dead. Okay, so we've got to have, there's, we gotta have faith, but we also got to have works. And folks, that's not what the text is saying at all. Dearly beloved, what the text is saying is that if we have faith, if we have one, we'll have the other. If we have true faith, we'll have works. That there's a dynamic, a solid, absolute connection between faith and works. And those works are not our own. They're not our own. Now, we can brag all day long that what we do for Christ is our own. That the works that we do are our own. But we would be boasting unjustly. They're not our works. What, what must we do to do the works of God? His disciples asked, believe on God, on God whom He has sent. Believe on the one whom He has sent. Uh, I'm going to suggest, you know, as far as if, if someone was to walk up to me and ask me, well, Steve, why are, if, if we're not under the law, why are, are so many commands given us? I would suggest that what other way would we know to have a, the righteousness of God? What other way could God possibly explain the nature of true righteousness without giving us those commands? Think about it. Personally, and I have for the longest time, I believe that what we are seeing when we look at the commands of God given us in the New Testament, Right, which are placed right alongside the fact that we've died to the law that we might bear fruit unto God, is that what we are looking at is not as much something to do in order to gain merit or favor with God. But we, what we are actually seeing is a lovely portrait of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I'm going to suggest. The commands themselves are just a lovely picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. Without commands, we have no way of knowing the righteousness of God. There's also the fact that we are one in Christ. There's a unity that exists 
and that what affects one member affects the other. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. We're looking at a body context in which when you bring law and legalism into it, which we think might have prevented this, which it would not have, because the flesh does what it does. Dearly beloved, we are conformed to the Word of God by the, both by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. We do not conform our lives to this book. Okay, You need to reverse your thinking. What, what is occurring in the life of the Christian today under grace is, is that the Word of God, the truth of God, the Spirit of God is we are being conformed by the Word of God, the truth of God, the Spirit of God. It's not that we take it upon ourselves to somehow clean up the flesh, clean up the old man, and conform ourselves to the instructions or the commands or the imperatives given us in this book. It's, it's just the opposite. We Modern Christianity today has gotten it backwards, just like pretty much like they've gotten every, everything else. They put the cart before the horse, okay? But we're not talking about redemption here. We're talking about deliverance, rescue, salvation, in order that His Spirit may be saved in the day of Christ Jesus. Now, you know, you would think that when we turn to John chapter 15 and we read what is written there about him being Christ being the vine and we being the branches and that we abide in him for apart from him we can do nothing that he's the one that produces the the branch folks does not produce the fruit okay it is the vine that produces the fruit when you plant a seed in the ground Christ being that seed God planted that seed in death that living seed, the seed went into the dark, damp earth, and it died. And as a result, you sprang forth. Paul says that death, so death works in us, but life in you. Coming to realize the fact that we've died to the law, we've died to sin, Satan, the law. We've, actually, we've died to six things. You can identify six things that we've died to in the Word of God. Sin, self, law, the world, Satan, and even death itself. We've died to death, okay? We will never die. Death to self is... On the one hand, an awful thing to have to experience and to go through. But that's what we've been called to do. To suffer for His sake. We die daily. We die in order that others may live. We die to sin. We die to self. We die to the world. That is the world, religious, the ecclesiastical system. The religious system. We died to Satan. Now, now the, we, we died in, in fact, in reality. When Christ was crucified, we were crucified with Him. It's not that we need to die to the old man. I mean, I, I, over the years, I've had Christians write to me, Steve, I've tried, I've just tried to die to sin, and I just can't do it. Dearly beloved, you have died to sin. You have put on the new man. Okay? You are not your old man. You're a new creation in Christ. Paul clearly stated in Romans chapter 7, clearly stated, it is not I who sins, but sin which dwells in me. You are not your old man. The flesh profits nothing. You can't clean up the old man. The only thing to, that can bring effectual Positive change in the Christian's life is the work of God. And it's our belief and our faith in what He did, that His work was sufficient, that we don't have to add anything to it. That what we see in this book, dearly beloved, 
is a lovely picture of his life lived in and through the life of the believer by faith. And now I'm talking, when I say faith, I'm talking about the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. It's our faith exercised in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That God is faithful, not us. We are not, it, is not, it does not depend upon our faithfulness. Okay? We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of ourselves. Just going to quickly run through a few verses here. Uh, there's so many. I, it would just take a tremendous amount of work to just throw them all up on the screen. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Dearly beloved, how did you receive Him? How did you receive Him? That's something that you ought to spend some time at least meditating on. How did you receive Him? Because you're told to walk in Him in the same way that you received Him. Did you receive Him by law or did you receive Him by grace? Many are fam familiar with Philippians chapter 3. Paul says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but rubbish that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Same thing that Paul mentions in Romans. That I may know Him. That's, that's not a perfect knowledge. Paul already knows him, perfect knowledge. This is the epigonosco, it's experiential knowledge. That I may have an experiential knowledge of him, and the, that I may know the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Being made, not conforming myself unto his death, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might, maybe I will, maybe I won't, it's a subjunctive mood, the mood of uncertainty, that I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And we read that and we, we think that's talking about his bodily resurrection. It is not. The out, it's a very unique word there, by the way, in the Greek. It is Ek has the word out from in front of the word resurrection. It only, only occurs once. The out resurrection from the dead. That is raised from the dead to walk in newness of life, his life, here in the present. That's what the text is saying. This is Paul's desire that he might attain unto the out resurrection of the dead. What's really interesting about John chapter 6 is we see that the we see in our present study, you know, the mention of leaven, that we, we are unleavened, that uh, we are members of His body, that, uh, uh, there was a, uh, that Christ is our Passover, uh, there was a feast that, that followed the Pass Passover, that He took the bread, He broke it, He said, this is my body, okay? That we feast upon Christ, His body, that's what we feast upon. That's every time we come together, we feast upon His Word, we feast upon the bread of life, and we see the bread of life mentioned in John chapter 6. Then said they unto Him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you do everything that I told you to do. No. No. It's what Israel, this is what God said of Israel. They didn't do one thing that He told them to do. But Jesus answered and said unto them, this is, this is the work of God that you believe on Him whom He has sent. Ephesians chapter, chapter 3, verse 7, Whereof I, Paul, was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. There's power in grace. There's no power in law. Ephesians 4.15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. 
So truth and grace, there's a connect, direct connection there between our growing up in Christ and truth. The truth of this book. Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Uh, there's power in the Word. We don't conform our lives to that book. That book, the, the truth of the words of the, on the Word, the truth of that book is what conforms us to the image of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually work, worketh also in you that believe. The word effectually works in us. Philemon's 1 6, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of, of what? Of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 2, wherefore laying aside all malice, all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and, and evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If so be, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. How could you not read that and not see how that that's tied directly into 1 Corinthians chapter 5? John 1.1 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Folks, this book is God. It's, it's the Word was God. Christ is the Word. Hopefully, prayerfully, it is my sincere, deep desire that those who are listening to me will understand that when it comes to the matter of growing in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, not growing in grace and in, in law and knowledge of your ability in the flesh, but growing in grace and knowledge of Christ, when it comes to the matter of, of, of what many would refer to as uh, sanctification or progressive sanctification. You know, we're past the point of redemption. We're in, in Christ. We're growing in grace and knowledge of Christ. When it comes to the matter of being conformed to the image of Christ, we know that we're, we're led by the Spirit of God. He doesn't lead us. God did not redeem us to lead us by the Holy Spirit for the Holy Spirit to take our hand and lead us down the path of law-keeping as a rule of life. It is my sincere, utmost prayer that those of you who are listening to, to me will take and think about these things. I don't ask anyone to agree with me on anything, but just to think about these things, to meditate on these things, to meditate on how that this book, which we call the Word of God, which so many today tend to neglect you know they'll cherry pick verses and they'll you know to try to uh, I don't know, to try to prove or to try to substantiate their own narrative their own point you know they have a they have they know what they believe they have this uh, their own belief system they had they know what they believe and so they'll go to the book They'll find verses that support what they believe. And that's not something we should ever do. We only believe what we believe because it's written. Sanctify them, Jesus prayed in John 17. Sanctify them. Through thy truth, thy word is truth. I'm going to suggest that that is exactly what we're looking at. The mind of the Holy Spirit in in this chapter of 1 Corinthians, chapter 5, is, is exp he's explaining the bringing forth for their consideration that same reality that we are sanctified through the truth 
of the Word of God. Now we have been set aside, sanctify meaning set aside. We have been set aside for God's purpose right from the beginning. We saw that at the beginning of the epistle. Of the epistle. But we are, we are continually sanctified, set apart through the truth of this book. 2 John 1.4 I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in law. I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. James 1.18 Of his own will begat he us. Now here we're looking at redemption, not salvation. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. If it was not for the, the, word, the word of truth, this book, and the, and the work of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit, you could have never been redeemed. Of His own will begat He us. That's, be, that's, be, that's born again, folks, with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of His cre creatures. Back to our present study. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, which is exactly what we, we saw in the verses that preceded this, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I love you all. I truly do. I pray for you all constantly. I ask you for your continued prayers for the direction of this ministry. I do believe our Lord is returning soon. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.